I thought by way of introduction that it might be helpful for me to say a little bit about what I learned as a young person from that experience and what it sort of moved me to think about in relation to the importance of addressing questions of diversity, addressing questions of equity, addressing questions about the possibility and the potential for social change. And there are three things particular that come to mind for me in terms of this. One is that lasting and meaningful change comes often from sustained struggle. Pat was very clear about conveying to me that she thought it was important to say something about the quality of the experience of the students during the time that they were at high school in 1957 and 1958 in Little Rock, Arkansas. And suffice it to say that it was an extraordinarily difficult and challenging year. Uh, Rachel brought up the category of everyday experience being something that can unify people. And questions about uh, how one goes into the gym locker room as a high school student, what one's experience is as one is walking up the stairs, what happens when one is carrying one's book from class to class, how one is addressed by a teacher as one is preparing to take an exam or give a presentation. All of these were actually, I think, experiences that made the, the, my father and the other eight members of the Little Rock Nine feel as if they were more divided from those that were in the high school rather than unified. And that's not to dispute the way that Rachel characterized how important it is to acknowledge everyday experience as something that should bring us together. But oftentimes we have to reckon with the ways in which everyday experience, at least in the moment, can divide us away. And one has to find ways to name that, speak about it honestly, and struggle to change it. And so certainly one of the things that came from thinking about the experience of my father and the other members of the nine was that one had to apply oneself to changing conditions that were not right, changing conditions that did not allow people to be able to do their best, changing conditions that prevented people from being able to work together. Resilience is very important in relation to being able to achieve that. Faith in the correctness of one's position even when one is in a minority. And I think it's safe to say that at least in the late days of September when the students first were able to come into Little Rock School, those that supported this campaign were probably not more than a few thousand in a city of many, many, many thousands, well over um, 200 or 300,000, 200,000 I think it was at Little Rock at the time. So that even the African American community in Little Rock at that time understood the justness of the position in ideal, but wondered whether or not this was the right time to do this, whether or not this was going to result in difficult impacts in relation to people. History has proven that it was a correct decision, but without the resilience, without the commitment to seeing that through, through very, very difficult conditions all through that year and for a few years afterwards, we would never know whether or not that had been the case in Little Rock. So change comes from struggle. Understanding the big picture is a first step towards effective strategy. That was the second lesson that I took from the story of Little Rock. And even though this was a story about everyday relations, the question of being able to go to school, the question about being able to ratify, in a sense, the decision of the Supreme Court in the Brown decision in 1954, None of it would have come to some kind of reasonably successful resolution had it not been for the fact that a president decided to overmand a governor and send members of the US Armed Forces to a city in order to guarantee that students could go to school. Big decisions, big measures, dramatic challenges in relation to the ways in which that governor, that mayor, congressman, and other people in the city had banded together to resist the presence of students there. And I like to think about that, and I didn't sort of think about it obviously as a historian when I was a young kid, but I like to think about that as being evidence of the ways in which sometimes you have to look well beyond your personal and local prospect in order to understand how to transform the conditions that you see that constitute some kind of obstacle, some kind of impediment to being able to move things towards a more equitable, more just, more diverse result and outcome. And so that sense of being able to flip the script in a sense and turn what was a local struggle around going to school into a full-blown constitutional crisis in terms of whether state 
or federal powers ultimately were going to prove to be superior and what was a proper way of thinking about the Constitution. Obviously, this had to do with the decision of a president. It had to do with the decision of jurists and columnists. But it also had to do with the decision of those that were allies of the Nine and the Nine themselves to press the question and constantly point out that this was not only a simple issue of access to school, this was a question literally of civil right. And it needed to be settled in that way as a civil right question constitutionally. Third, victory or even just simple incremental process, progress is often the product not of days, but of months and sometimes of years. I think one of the most poignant stories, and this was not something obviously that I understood as a young child, but it was something that I understood by the 1980s or so as I was in my 20s. One of the most poignant indications of this was that my father and the other members of the Nine would speak about the way that their experience of how other people perceived what it is that they had done by going to school changed in a very powerful way in 1987. Because in September of 1987, the 30th anniversary of the Little Rock story, that was um, a, a period in which Governor, then Governor Bill Clinton, invited my father and I believe six or seven of the other members of the Nine to come to the governor's mansion and basically to share a meal, to uh, convey stories, to discuss what had happened, and so that Governor Clinton at that point could convey how important it was to the state of Arkansas that they had done what they had done. It was really the first time that anybody in an official position of leadership in the state of Arkansas had ever made a gesture like that. Prior to that point, those of you that are old enough to remember this story, Many whites, uh, many others in the country felt like it was an unfortunate example of divisiveness, an unfortunate example of conflict. The resolution was unclear. After all, it was only my father and I think three of the other nine that were actually able to graduate from Central High School. So this was something that was better forgotten, better sort of put to the side. Not till 1987 were there people in official positions of leadership who were prepared to say, this is actually an important moment in relation to this country's history. We need to find a way to celebrate it rather than trying to find ways to forget it. And educational equity in Little Rock, I won't talk long about this, is still something that I think many people still feel is not yet achieved, is important to try to continue to struggle for in a range of different ways. But just remembering this event as something that mattered took a lot of time. And so that, I think, is its own very clear indication that sometimes what we have to think about in terms of our work is how to put ourselves and devote ourselves and how to put others who work with us in the struggle for the long haul, to think in over the long term about what appear to be results that would tell us that these things matter and that these are things that are worth pursuing. Clearly, Little Rock Nine, the story of the Little Rock Nine, is a great example of the power of history. And yet, when we move from that struggle in 1957 to the kinds of challenges that each of you probably face in 2012, we realize that there are important differences that mean that we have to distinguish between stories like the story of Little Rock and stories like the stories that you deal with on an everyday basis who, for instance, you are speaking about in terms of trying to pursue questions of diversity is changed from 1957. Immigration, as Louise elo eloquently pointed out, means that we're thinking about very, very different and broader groups of people in terms of who constitute our workforces. Globalization means that you're thinking in different sorts of ways about markets, about best practices, about ways to understand trajectories and long-term strategies in terms of your respective industries, including strategies related to hiring. What, impeding, what it is that impedes progress has also changed from people sort of mobbing outside of a school and preventing people from being able to come in, from National Guards with drawn bayonets preventing students from being able to enter into doors, to much more subtle sometimes very unconscious ways in which people engage in raising barriers, practicing discrimination, presuming someone not up to a given task in relation to the work that one does. And finally, and this is important, how one encourages and even leads towards these goals of diversity and equity requires different choices 
Much as I would imagine some of you imagine this as something that you would like to do, I doubt it's the case that tomorrow any of you will be calling in the paratroopers to address a problem in terms of a remark that someone has made or a poor advertisement that has come from your creative department or some set of objectionable practices. So other sorts of measures need to be brought up in order to be able to figure out how to address the problems that one sees today. We can learn something from history, but we certainly can't learn everything from history. We have to invent, in many ways, the solutions to the problems that we see. So like Rachel, I do not know the ways in which you do your work, and I'm very eager and interested to find out more about it over the course of the day. So I don't want to presume to try to tell you how to engage with this. What I do do as an academic historian is think about the importance of history and try to convey that to the different audiences that I come into. So what I'd like to spend my remaining time talking about is what use I think history might provide as a general sort of way of thinking, as a general practice, in order to put you in positions in which you can address the problems that you best know how to engage in from the various places that you work. First, greater awareness of history, it seems to me, is a great way to cultivate the capacity for yourself, for your coworkers, for your superiors, for the people that come in as entry hires, to have an appreciation for exactly the bigger picture that I was just talking about a moment ago as one of the lessons that I learned in relation to Little Rock. History never comes simply. It rarely comes in black and white compartments. It is messy. It spills over the kinds of boundaries, even as it defines those boundaries that Rachel was talking about. And it makes often for extremely peculiar bedfellows. And so if we want to think about how to appreciate where our coworkers, where the practice of our firms, where the problems that we challenge come from, we have to dig very, very deep. And we have to find ways to dig sufficiently deep in order to point out unanticipated connections, ones that are not obvious, one that take a little bit of care, one that takes some study. And I think this notion of swapping stories, for instance, that Louise brought up is an excellent way to think about this. In some ways, a historian's job, rarely I would imagine as eloquently as Louise does it, is to bring together stories and try to come up with some sort of synthesis in terms of thinking about this. Let me give one example of the ways in which I think this works very well. And I believe this is something, if my memory serves it correctly, that I did in this very conference room some time ago at Kirkland and Ellis when the, uh, the documentary on the um, activist Bayard Rustin was screened, I believe, a year ago or maybe two years ago. I think it was here at Kirkland Ellis, although I may have that wrong. This documentary is fascinating. Bayard Rustin, of course, was a very, very cherished lieutenant of Martin Luther King. He was one of the organizers of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, one of the founders and implementers of it. He was the architect of the March on Washington. He was an extraordinary pacifist, labor organizer, and civil rights activist. He was also an openly gay black man. And whenever this documentary, which was first done in 2002, 2003, is shown to the audiences, one of the things that I'm always struck by are the ways in which African-American affinity groups, uh, GBT, uh, G GLBT affinity groups, and also affinity groups that are committed to things like social justice, pacifism, civil rights, nonviolent struggle, are able to find some set of common interchanges and common interactions. But that's not possible unless one digs very, very deep into that history and not reduce Bayard Rustin simply to a friend of Martin Luther King or simply the organizer of the uh, March on Washington, but instead to think about the totality of the individual or the totality of the struggle or the totality of the cause, even when it raises uncomfortable truths in relation to any number of those affinity groups that I just spoke about. Uh, pacifist groups, for instance, moved away from Bayard Rustin because he was seen to be not sufficiently passionate in his denunciation of the Vietnam War. Civil rights groups began to see Bayard Rustin as a suspect partner because of the ways in which he engaged so thoroughly in terms of cultivating close ties with the National Democratic Party and the administration of Lyndon Johnson. And African American and early gay rights activists were not necessarily sure that they could see eye to eye in relation to this individual because of tensions that existed between those communities. Sometimes it's really history that allows us to have to, 
acknowledge and reckon with the fact that the boundaries need to be addressed as arbitrary, but also to find the discourse and find the language in order to be able to criticize and dismantle those boundaries actively. I'm sure many of you already do this in relation to your advice to individuals, in relation to the programming that you do. But history is an extraordinary way to make people think big. And it's important to get people to think big in order to try to find ways to get them to change their practices. I think oftentimes the messiness of coming up with a solution, the fact that it does not immediately reveal itself to a kind of problem that one would face within the private sector, within a particular firm, in terms of employee relations, is often one that can be best addressed by drawing different sorts of analogies to history, to thinking about the ways in which history similarly reveals a messy, unanticipated, not necessarily clear course to solving problems. And I think one way to think about this, since we are, after all, in a law firm, is what does it mean to come up with the capacity to generate a kind of case law reservoir in order to be able to establish the precedent, in order to be able to argue the logic for what it is that one is doing. So oftentimes, I think the steps probably that many of you take on an every day or every week basis in terms of your work are not ones that are seeking to resolve a problem all at once but establish bit by incremental bit what the logic, what the argument, what the, what the correctness is of moving things in a particular sort of way. History, similarly, I think, is an incremental way of thinking. One tries to find small pieces of evidence, gather them together, build on top of building, and eventually come up with a grand and larger argument that changes the ways in which we think about things. Go back, for instance, to the legal support or the legal rationale for moving forward with the desegregation of the high school in Little Rock in the first place in 1957. It was the Brown case, which was the product not only of a series of Supreme Court decisions stretching all the way back to 1938, but also the establishment of a particular sort of exercise of civil rights law by Charles Hamilton Houston coming out of Harvard and going to Howard that was begun in the mid-1930s. It was literally a 20-year struggle in terms of establishing in painstaking detail how would it be possible to attack segregation as legal and justified by attacking it at one of its weakest points, which was the ways in which it established um, inequality of opportunity at the point of schooling in the United States. And so these kinds of senses of needing to think incrementally, of establishing a kind of case law reservoir for making the arguments that you want to, I think this is something that history can be helpful in terms of finding ways to say, just as people worked in this sort of way to slowly lay the foundation for change, so too can we think in terms of slow, gradual, but inexorable and irreversible movements towards trying to change cultures that we see the need to do so with in our firms. And third, history always, always has at least two sides. This is obviously true in terms of appreciating the ways in which a story like Little Rock is not just the story of nine students who desegregated a high school, but the story of thousands and hundreds of thousands of people who lived in Little Rock at the time, many of whom opposed those students going to school, my father and others. And their stories, even as I or others might argue against it, have to be, must be appreciated in order to understand what fully is to be learned from that. So clearly, in terms of thinking about how to handle various incidents that come up, various sorts of episodes, various challenges, getting the full story means thinking sometimes about those that are seen as wrongdoers in relation to different kinds of codes as people who sort of bring you know, the operation or the team or the community back rather than pushing it forward. But I think appreciating the complexity and the diversity of stories also means understanding the ways in which those that represent what appears to be the right or represents a kind of elevated consciousness aren't always necessarily so sure about the stories themselves. And here I'm speaking about those who are employees of color, those who are women employees, those who are coming from a number of other different groups. Sometimes they are not absolutely expert witnesses in relation to the kinds of conditions that are being spoken to there. I think the proper response to that is empathy and a kind of mutual education rather than rejection and shaming, needless to say.
Think, for instance, if, if one was to sort of say where the, the whole project of thinking critically about race in the United States really first emerged in a kind of full-blown way, one would probably go back to W.B. Du Bois, the extraordinary African-American activist and thinker at the turn of the 19th into the 20th century. And many of you are familiar with the phrase double consciousness as a kind of way of representing the challenges of thinking about oneself as being marked by race as other within the United States. That you not only know yourself, but you have to know yourself and then understand all of the ways in which people perceive you and incorporate that into your understanding of your self-image. There's a great sort of clause that comes after that formulation where Du Bois talks about the challenge of people having divided aims as a result of experiencing that condition of having to see themselves through the eyes of others, something that I think is still very, very powerful in terms of the ways in which race is lived. Divided aims means then that sometimes people aren't able to tell coherently their story. They're not able to come up and access many of the elements that, constitu that constitute who it is that they are. And so I think similarly, not just in terms of the process of changing companies, but the process of giving room for people to evolve and fully appreciate who they understand themselves to be. What kinds of contributions can they make? This is a positive reason for thinking about diversity work in relation to the various firms and institutions that you are at. And finally, history, I think, has a double edge. It can both be used, certainly, to encourage people to think in different sorts of ways about the sort of large scope of the struggles that they face, the roots of the problems that they're trying to transform, the deep resources that individuals and groups come from. But history can also be something that shuts down, creates its own barriers in a certain sense, among and between groups, as Rachel very eloquently said a moment ago. And here, in closing, I would like you to think about the turn that is beginning to come up in relation to how we think about race and history in the United States, particularly since uh, then candidate, now President Barack Obama, gave that very extraordinary speech in Philadelphia toward a more perfect union, which was trying to get at some set of different ideas about how to understand the place of race in the 21st century. And one of the things that was most important in that speech was the way in which uh, Barack Obama, during that speech, spoke about how important it was to understand that sometimes history can instruct us that nothing changes, that it's impossible to realize progress, that there's no way to change the minds of people that come out of particular sorts of formations, and that for him, this was something that he wanted to push against. He understood his candidacy at that point. I would imagine even for all of the divisiveness and rancor that he's experienced as a president since, he would still say that one of the things that he thinks is most important about his presidency is how it's been able to show that in some areas, some places, among some people, in fact, things do change. After all, we were talking five years ago about how impossible it was to ever imagine an African-American being elected president within the United States. Not something that's resulted in the end of problems of racial inequality or even just outright racism, but something that clearly tells us that things that we didn't believe could happen sometimes can. And so I think on that point, it's important to respect that using history effectively is not just about studying its content, not just about taking its episodes or bringing out its facts and deploying them at the different moments that one needs to, it's also about understanding its spirit and the ways in which it is complicated, it is messy, it is something that defies predictions, but it brings some kind of change. Not necessarily the change that we expect, not necessarily the change that we want, but it will change things. And I think that lesson of thinking about how to convey both to those that you are trying to encourage to think in broader ways and those who feel aggrieved that you're trying to get to think in more sustained, resilient, and committed ways, that the fact that things do change is something that's important to take into mind in relation to voting oneself to shaping and molding that change, hopefully towards the better. Thank you, and I look forward to the rest of the conversation.